Hi, Dr. Weinstein. Hi, how are you? I'm great. How is everything? Everything's going really well. Um, I'm actually in a treatment room right now with our patient, mm -hmm. and I'm here with my nurse and our team. And so I'm going to hand off the phone to um, Jean Luca, who helps me with the media. And he's going to take the video so that we can chat and I can show you what's going on. That's here. I want to give a brief inter introduction as to who you are. Or Ellis, she is board certified dermatologist based out of Rochester, New York. We are so so excited to have you here again for the third time. And in the give a little introduction as to what you're doing today um, in regards to treatments. Yeah, sure. So I'm going to actually just hand it off here. Oh. Hold on. Yeah. Hello. 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 All right. We're all ready. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Can everyone yeah. hear me? All great. <laughs> okay, perfect. So today we are treating our patient, Sarah. We're doing a treatment called a clear and brilliant. Um, keep going, man. My nurse, Nancy, is the one who helps me with all these treatments. So we kind of tag team um, and do them as our patients come in. The Clear and Brilliant is a great treatment for a few different things. So it's excellent for um, sun damage, so hyperpigmentation, also melasma, so pigmentary condition that can get worse in the sun and in the summer. It's great for um, uh, enlarged pores and also textural changes on the skin. So things like very mild acne scarring um, and just an overall refresh. So it's a nice treatment that we do before like weddings and things like that. Amazing. So are you gonna be performing that first? Yes, so Sarah came in about a half an hour early to her appointment and we put a topical numbing cream on her skin and we have a private waiting room that she sat in to, um, to numb. There's a TV in there, there's Wi-Fi, so it's actually a really comfortable environment um, for patients to wait. And then Nancy or one of my other nurses, Tracy, will bring brought Sarah back, wiped off her numbing cream, and started the treatment. Awesome. Well, hi, Sarah. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Great to be here. <laughs> so... Do you care to explain kind of what's going on right now, um, now that the numbing treatment has been put on her face? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we can zoom in closely to Sarah's face. So mm -hmm. this is called, this is a clear and brilliant laser. It's the Permea handpiece. It's a 1927 wavelength. So that means it targets water and it's gonna function really superficially on the skin to help heat up the water around some of those um, melanocytes or the cells that create dark pigment on our skin to break them down and then our body will excrete them. So um, Nancy will do Sarah's cheeks separately. So she started on this side and then she'll do this side and then she'll uh, move on to the forehead and the nose last is usually the, the order we go in. Um, Sarah is wearing protective eye eyewear. Um, these are just little stickers that come off and it's not sticky in the middle so it doesn't rip out your beautiful eyelashes. Um, and then you'll notice that all of us have protective eyewear on as well because whenever you're in laser rooms or using lasers you need to protect your eyes against that specific wavelength of laser that you're using because it can be very harmful in some cases. So everybody in the room is wearing protective eyewear. Um, the other thing that's happening is the Clear and Brilliant is a fractionated, non-ablative laser. Okay. So creating little columns of heat um, and delivering heat into the skin in these fractionated columns. So it's kind of like aerating the lawn, but it's not actually poking holes mechanically. It's using the heat um, to, to create these columns. So in doing so, like I said, we're heating up that pigment and causing it to break down. And we are also promoting new collagen production. So after this treatment, Sarah will notice that she has a nice glow to her skin. Um, and that usually comes about three to four days after the treatment. 
Okay, awesome. And right now, obviously, there is treatment, but is anything painful? Is it a tingly feeling that you're feeling from this laser? Like, how is the how is the patient's skin reacting? Is it burning? Just to um, get a better sense of um, on a patient's end what yeah. they. Okay. No, I'm happy to talk to that. It's actually um, a very relaxing, enjoyable process. I can't feel much. Um, if I do feel anything, it just feels like a slight tingling. No discomfort, mm -hmm. no pain, no burning. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's been really enjoyable. Nancy keeps checking in with me, asking me how I'm doing, how I feel. So constant check-in is really helpful too. And I can let her know if there's a problem. But so far, so good. I'm excited to see how it looks. Great. I'm excited. And Dr. Is she the um, results when she walked Can you repeat that again? Yes, of course. Are you going to see results when she walks out of the treatment room right away? Okay, so that's a good question. So basically the question is about downtime. Um, so after Sarah's treatment, her skin's going to be a little bit pink looking. I'm no more pink than it looks right now. Mm -hmm. um, but over the, like later on today, it'll probably get a little more pink and maybe a, a touch swollen, but nothing that's going to be um, visible to anybody else but Sarah. She probably knows her skin feels like a little taut and hot. And that feeling of heat will wear off in about an hour or so. So we'll give her some ice packs to use, which some patients, honestly, they take them and they say, I don't need these. Um, and they throw them out on their way out. But for the most part, the ice packs help with that feeling of heat on the skin. And then tomorrow when Sarah wakes up, she'll feel like a roughness to the skin. So it's almost like sandpaper feeling. And those are those little, um, we call them MENS, or they're microscopic epidermal necrotic debris. So it's basically like dead skin cells um, being eliminated from the skin post-treatment. And that's all, uh, you know, how this fractionated technology works. Over time, that feeling of roughness will start to kind of slough off. Okay. Um, that process is so subtle, nobody will notice it's happening except Sarah. So okay. this is a really low to no downtime procedure. I mean, she can leave here and go straight back to work. And would you suggest staying out of sun for how long? I mean, of course, stay out of the sun, keep sunscreen on. But in terms of the treatment right after, what would you say? How does yeah. Hello. Definitely don't want to be um, in the sun after the treatment. We do okay. advise and kind of guide you through post-treatment care. Mm -hmm. So you're going to use your gentle cleansers, gentle moisturizers. You take a break from your active. So if you use um, retinoids regularly or, you know, a strong salicylic acid wash or things like that, we'll have you take a break for at least three or four days after the treatment. Um, and with that comes the use of SPF, of course, every day um, in the morning, you know, you'll wash, you'll put your moisturizer on and then an SPF. Absolutely. If you have a vacation plan or something, um, you know, close after the treatment, we would probably advise that you give yourself at least a week or two um, before any sunny vacations. And that's just to promote better um, healing and to optimize your results. Of course. And um, in terms of treatment time, how long is this treatment really going to take? And do you suggest them, your patients come back in for more than one? Um, oh, yeah. So, so Clear and Brilliant is one of those treatments that you want to maintain. So let's say, you know, Sarah has had some issues in the past specifically with some pigment on the skin. So she might have a touch of melasma. Um, and so to get the best results, we would advise a patient like Sarah to come in um, every month. So every four to six weeks or so, depending on scheduling, um, for about four to six times. So we're looking at, you know, a period of six months to complete her treatment course. And then, you know, I have some patients who come in for this treatment, like I said, prior to their wedding. So we'll do, you know, a series of four treatments based monthly to get their skin in tip-top shape prior to the wedding. Um, and then I have another subset of patients who really just want to maintain the health of their skin. You know, they might be in that 25 to 35 range, not a lot going on, but just to maintain. So this 
you know, is a procedure that could really replace your facials. Let's say that you're going for facials every month. I've had a lot of patients come in for the clear and brilliant instead of their facials and the results and the outcomes are just not even comparable. Uh, so, okay. Yeah. yeah. Would you say um, a patient goes for a facial, are they able to get clear and brilliant after, or you suggest just doing clear and brilliant during the time of treatment? I honestly, I've weaned all, a lot of my patients off of facials. I think facials are great okay. as a spa experience and a mode of relaxation and good for your mental health. But in terms of a workhorse for your skin, um, it's not really my favorite thing. So if patients are going for facials, we wouldn't have them, of course, do this treatment on the same day, but they can still do them. I would say just space it out about a week or so. Awesome. And head back to Nancy. How many times are you going over her face with the treatment or the laser? So that's a good question. That depends on a patient's skin color. It also depends on if they have a history of melasma. She has some darker areas. This is the first time that she's had this laser, so we'd want to be super careful. We have it on, there's different settings. I have it on a low setting, and um, Dr. Weinstein determines how many passes you can go up to eight. So we're doing six today, just on a low, and see how her skin responds. Mm, understood. And um, for the number of passes, are you going to go through the whole face? Are you just going to go the cheeks? Or it really just depends, like you said, Nancy, on um, the patient's skin as she has like darker spots or brown spots. Yeah, so I would treat the whole face um, okay. in sections, like cheek, forehead, the other cheek, and the nose area. Mm -hmm. um, you don't do one section all at once just because you don't want so much heat. Okay. Um, Dr. Weinstein can probably elaborate on that, <laughs> but um, you just wouldn't want a lot of heat in one area all at the same time, so we kind of break it up a little bit, and I keep track of how many passes I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another really important thing to note, Brooke, is we, we don't want to just focus on the face, right? So when you're coming in for anti-aging treatments or, you know, um, skin health, uh, skin maintenance treatments, you want to look at your face, but also your neck, your chest, the back of your hands. These are all places that, you know, show your age. And oftentimes patients are so hyper-focused on the face that really their neck, their chest, and their hands don't match their age or the way that their face looks. So um, oftentimes we would also treat Sarah's like neck and jawline her chest if there's some sun damage there, and also if there were brown spots or textural issues, um, crepey skin on the hands, we could also treat that all in the same setting. And would, so all in the same setting, all with clear and brilliant? Yes, we could do those treatments all with the clear and brilliant, yes. Wow, so it really is, it's like very, very non-invasive, it's little to no downtime, there's no needles, it's comfortable as um, Sarah was saying, and there's notice noticeable results, and it can be used um, on your neck, your jawline, etc. So it seems to me like clear and brilliant is probably one of the top laser surfacing treatments that you might have um, available for your patients. Do you a lot of the times recommend clear and brilliant um, to your patients, especially when they want fast results? Yeah, so, you know, I think Clear and Brilliant has its place um, for right. our younger patient population. So, like I said, between, you know, early 20s to mid-30s. Um, and it also just depends on what your skin looks like and, it, and how much sun damage or skin um, textural issues that you have. So, it's really an individual um, evaluation and treatment plan. Um, I can't say I recommend it for all of my patients and it's my go-to for all of my patients because when you come in as a patient, I treat you, you know, as an individual and we look at what skin concerns you have and how best to address that. You'll see around our room, we have, you know, just in this room, we have multiple other devices that can also be used. Um, but for, for the purposes of demonstration, this is a nice treatment to kind of give you a sneak peek on 
because um, we can wear clear glasses um, and it has such little downtime and really yields beautiful results. Awesome. And um, what was I about to say? I lost my train of thought. But um, for Clear and Brilliant specifically, is there someone who would not be a great candidate for it? Like, when would you be like, mm, I'm not sure if Clear and Brilliant is right for you? Someone who, um, I'm going to move over here because we're about to switch. Uh, we're going to kind of clean Sarah off and prepare her for some injections. So mm -hmm. that'll be really fun. Um, but so, you know, I wouldn't recommend Clear and Brilliant for somebody who's looking for more. So let's say they have um, really bad acne scarring or boxcar type scars or things where you really want to see a difference. Um, this laser is just not strong enough for that type of skin concern. Or if it's an older patient and they have um, really etched lines around the mouth, for example. Okay. That's isn't probably the most appropriate treatment to get to where you want to be at the end. So, you know, this is a treatment where, like, it's a very gentle procedure. There's minimal risk. There's minimal downtime. It's really easy to do. Um, so, it, you know, it, if we stay in that category of skin concerns, that's definitely my go-to. Amazing. And as you just said, we're going to prep Sarah for Botox injections. And one of our um, viewers asked, are fillers good to get as well during this process or you would only recommend Botox after Clear and Brilliant? That is a great question because mm -hmm. there's a few things that I could take into consideration to do combination procedures, which is getting more attention now because people have such limited time. They don't want to be back and forth to their dermatologist's office, you know, every other week to maintain their skin concerns. So we try to combine procedures as best we can um, and as safely as we can. So after Clear and Brilliant, we we definitely do Botox. That's pretty routine. Something we need to be concerned or, you know, where or that I think about is that Sarah's going to be more swollen, right? So I need to make sure that my injections are placed just so, right? I have to make sure I know my anatomy, that I'm marking her out properly. And that's something that I do all day, every day. So, you know, I, be, I consider myself an expert in that um, procedure. When it comes to filler, you have to be careful because, like I said, the clear and brilliant can cause a little bit of swelling on the skin. And so if you're filling, you know, like tear troughs under the eyes or the cheeks, they could look artificially um, enlarged or more plump after this treatment. And so it would not be my recommendation to fill post a laser that could cause some artificial swelling because that would yield then unpredictable results as the patient might go home thinking their results are going to settle a certain way and they're not because it wasn't a baseline um, picture when you started the treatment. Awesome. Great. Also, just to address someone else in the comments, they just asked where you're located and this is great. So Dr. Weinstein is located in Rochester, New York. Um, He's the director of cosmetic and laser surgery at the University of Rochester Medical. So, um, feel free to look her up on Hope Beauty and um, on the University of Rochester's website as well, um, as I'm sure she would be glad to have you. <laughs> How are we doing, Sarah? <laughs> oh, great. I can see my skin already. <laughs> that was a really good process. It was not bad at all. Very comfortable. Um, the team here is awesome, so... Oh, well, it's good to hear from you, and I'm so glad. Thank you for um, being here today and letting us use um, use you as our example because this is um, really exciting to watch um, live, in person, um, on the clock. So thank you very much. Okay. So um, we're now going to do Sarah's Botox. So this is her first time getting Botox. So um, do you have any questions or concerns? before we get started? Um, no, they've pretty much, you know, filled me in what I have to do and frown and, you know, be excited, frown. <laughs> keep, it, <laughs> keep it flat, get the wrinkles. So now I think I'm ready. So for first time injecting, um, there's a few things to consider. So, you know, I always ask if you want natural or you want a little bit more frozen. Um, frozen is not the trend, I just have to say right off the bat. Um, so I always will under treat a little bit your mm -hmm. 
time, so we call it like baby Botox. And then when you come back in two weeks, we can really see the results. And if Sarah says like, oh, I wanted this to look a certain way, we can always tweak it at that time. It takes about 10 to 14 days for Botox to really settle in. So we won't, Sarah won't really know what it's gonna look like until we see her back in those two weeks. So that's the first thing to note. And then in terms of risks, um, you know, where we inject, we can get a little bit of bruising. Okay. Or common around the eyes. Um, I don't, we're not gonna do this area today. So just, you know, for the purposes of today, we're gonna do her frown lines and a little bit on her forehead. Um, she doesn't really have super etched lines mm -hmm. at this moment, but the goal with the Botox is to prevent those from becoming more and more etched over time, okay? okay. You have your patients come in after two weeks. Yes, absolutely. They most all of them come in after two weeks, especially if it's their first treatment. Um, and then once we get to know each other and I create their recipe is what I call it, then oftentimes they don't need to come in because we're it's kind of like clockwork at that point. Exactly. And um, in terms of the Botox, would you say that your skin's more sensitive now that you had clear and brilliant? It's, um, yeah, it is a, it's going to be a little more sensitive, but remember she numbed for about 30 oh, okay. minutes prior. So mm -hmm. it might actually be more tolerable um, than if we just did it without her numbing. Understood. Okay, we're going to get started. Me so, um, I'm treating this area, so I'm going to have Sarah Brown. Okay, so I'm going after this muscle right here, which is called her corrugator, and re relax Sarah and frown again. So you can see how it sort of moves to create these 11 lines. So I'm going to pinch the corrugator and one, two, three, Sarah, a little pinch, one, two, three, and go right in and put a little bit there. How was that? No, I didn't even feel it. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So frown again, Sarah. Great. And then she's got another little part of this muscle right here. So I'm going to go ahead and inject, relax, Sarah. And I'm going to do a little bit right here. One, two, three. Perfect. Still good? Great. Perfect. And then just relax. There's a muscle right here called the procerus. Mm -hmm. And when Sarah frowns, some people's procerus is, are, um, is, a, is pretty active. And so what it does is create a horizontal crease. With Sarah, she doesn't have a very strong procerus. So um, we don't have to do a really high dose or a number of units. So I'll go right here to help that muscle. Just relax. One, two, three. Good. Okay. Um, so now we're going to do the other side. So just turn toward me, Sarah, and frown again. Can you see okay, Brooke? Yes, I can see everything. So awesome to watch. One, two, three. And frown again. And relax. One, two, three. Perfect. And so just turn straight again. So we've now treated her glabellar complex, which is that area on the face that creates those frown lines. And in order to complete this treatment, we're going to do a little bit of a brow lift because if we just paralyze these muscles, then Sarah might end up looking like this, which is that kind of fake surprise look that nobody wants to have. And so <laughs> by treating, right, Sarah? Yeah, no, okay, okay, good. Natural, please. Yes, yeah. we don't like that. <laughs> we want all natural. <laughs> natural. So now I'm going to treat a little bit of, the, of her ovicularis muscle. One, two, three. And that just helps to open up the eye, but not to make it go, you know, straight up like a Spock kind of eye. Mm -hmm. So now to do the anti Spock treatment, raise your brow up. We're going to look at the peak of her brow and do about three centimeters up, relax, and inject right here. Great. So that's our little secret so that she doesn't have those surprised uh, Spock brows. So I'm going to switch <laughs> sides. Okay. Good. Same thing here. One, two, three. I'll need another um, syringe. Feels okay? Doesn't feel, feel like anything? No, no. Okay. And then raise your brow up. 
Great, relax. One, two, three. Perfect. So now I'm gonna switch with Nancy one more time. I'm gonna just soften Sarah's um, horizontal lines across the forehead, which are really subtle. Um, so this would definitely be a prejuvenation technique. She doesn't really need a ton of toxin here, but over time, raise your brows up. All of these lines will become more pronounced um, okay. because we all use our forehead, right? So that this is a way to soften them and ensure that they don't become so pronounced and etched. Okay. Okay. So raise your brows up. Great. Relax. Do a little bit here. Just a little bit here. It seems like a lot of injections, but it's really a tiny amount of product in these areas. So that'll be it for her forehead. The other thing I really like to do as just a, a bonus because Nancy always gives me a tiny little bit extra <laughs> um, is treat the chin, okay? So, and I'll tell you why. The most common complaint I get from patients who come in, they're like, let's say mid forties and on, is that their lower face is starting to, they're starting to lose their lower face. It's becoming more, um, they're losing volume and they're noticing more wrinkling and sort of textural changes around the lower face. So one thing we can do to help that process, and this could be a whole nother IG Live, so I'm not gonna go into every little detail. Okay. Do to help that process is inject this muscle right here, which is called the mentalis. So, Sarah, can you just um, pucker for us? So, see when she puckers, we get this. We call it peau de orange look of the lower of the chin, which is like a rippled orange peel kind of look. And so, if I put a little, you can relax, a little bit of neuromodulator right here, it'll help to soften that muscle movement. And then oftentimes in people who have sort of a chin that they hold in that tense position, it will um, relax the chin and elongate it with just one simple injection. So mm -hmm. just a little uh, pro tip there. And we're all done. Oh so, my God. I have to say, Sarah, you're already glowing. Oh, <laughs> I feel like I am. So that's great. <laughs> Are. <laughs> um, Dr. That, was process. that was not bad at all. Amazing. Dr. Wines, you know, I have a question. Um, if you work out often and notice that your Botox isn't lasting as long, um, what would the reason behind this be? Like, what would sustain your Botox to be longer? Is there something that you should avoid to keep it um, working as long? Well, so the, the longevity of, the, of mm -hmm. Botox is dose dependent. So that's how many units were put in. So whether or not you work out or, you know, you, you metabolize things differently, it's going to last as long as, you know, a, a, as the dosing that was put in. So I hope that makes sense. Um, we yes. treat area, right? So I just treated her glabella and I know how many units I put in there, but that's not really how we charge our treatments. But some people, um, you know, they don't, it doesn't last as long, but you know, they should probably inquire um, as to how many units were placed in that circumstance. We know in some of the clinical studies or most of all of them that uh, neuromodulator will last and should last about three to four months um, across the board. In some patients, especially if it's your first time getting it, oftentimes it lasts a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the patients at that three to four month time period will say, you know, I start to feel my movement coming back and that now's the time to, to get a reboot, to get another treatment. Amazing. Amazing. Sarah, how are you doing? <laughs> Great. I, I really don't feel much at all on my face, a little mm -hmm. bit of a patient, but just kind of like I've been in the sun too long, a little bit of a sunburn. Other than that, no pain, nothing. Again, they checked in with me the entire time. I feel awesome. Oh, great. And Dr. Weinstein, what is next for Sarah? Is it um, ice packs, staying out of the sun, putting on sunscreen? What does that look like? So there's, so we did two treatments, right? So she'll have two sets of instructions. The first instructions okay. is she needs to move those muscles as we sort of trained her for the next um, four hours. So she's going to frown, 
raise her brows and sort of get the neuromodulator to take up into the muscle um, and, sort of, and diffuse naturally. And so that's what she's gonna do for her Botox treatments. She's also not going to lie down flat or do any sort of um, workouts for the next four hours. So the main thing is we don't want any like handstands, downward dogs, Pilates, anything where you're inverting. Um, we don't want the product to move after we placed it um, in those muscle groups. So that's for the Botox. For the Clear and Brilliant, she, right now, we're going to put some sunscreen on Sarah. And, you know, sh we could do ice packs. She doesn't seem like she really needs them at the moment. Um, so we could do ice packs. Um, so she'll do sunscreen. And then if it's a sunny day or, you know, she could also wear a hat. <laughs> but she'll kind of just protect herself from the sun. What do you have going on later? Um, just a few work meetings, but otherwise, that's about it. So and I'll, I feel fine enough to do my meetings. And if I go out in the sun, I'll be protected. Great. <gasps> yeah. yeah, on Zoom calls. So OK, so nobody on Zoom will know that yeah. she just had a procedure. No, definitely not at all. I'm jealous. I want that to be done on my face right now. <laughs> Um, Dr. Einstein, in terms of Botox, what are the, let's just, can we just briefly run through like the uses? Do you lot, a lot of the time see patients for TMJ with Botox? I know that's one of the uses. Yeah. So I'm not, you know, an oral and maxillofacial surgeon or a dentist, so sure. definitely we're there, but, um, Botox can definitely be used for TMJ, you know, for, you know, other uses that aren't cosmetic, it can be used for TMJ. So that's like pain in this area with chewing. Mm -hmm. The other area we can inject that helps with TMJ are the masseter muscles. So Sarah, if you clench down, can you mm -hmm. clench your teeth down? So she has very weak masseter muscles, which isn't a bad thing. But some people, when they clench, you'll see a bulky muscle sort of protrude right here. Um, and if we inject to that area, that can help a lot with TMJ. The other things Botox can be used for is um, migraines. So there is a whole nother um, area in the neurology world, and also some dermatologists do it, to inject for migraines. Um, it can be injected for blepharous spasm, which is actually its first indication. Um, it was developed back um, years ago by, uh, it was noted by Dr. Carruthers, and she used it. She's an op op ophthalmologist, and she used it for blepharospasm, and then noticed incidentally that her patient's um, wrinkles were softening. So it's it's been used for a lot of things. It's used in the prostate. I mean, I think we could have a whole nother session on that. Amazing. Is there anything else that you would like to review? Um, with everyone watching, I'm so thankful for all of you for tuning in. Dr. Weinstein, you're incredible, as always. Um, I absolutely loved everything about this and more. So um, the floor is yours to close us off on a high note, as always. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I would just say thank you all for joining in. Um, if there's anything else that you want to see live, Brooke and I and Hope Beauty will make it happen. And I'm just grateful well, to everybody else in this room. But we have a whole team. And I'm so grateful for them um, for helping us uh, get this together and for all of you. And we will save this video and post it on my feed um, on the IGTV. So you'll be able to access it and sort of review the things that we said anytime. And the last thing, if there are any other things you want to see, definitely put them in the comments so that... Please. We can sort of create those uh, experiences for you. Yes. Um, to just go off that quickly, of course, please comment anything you would like to see next. Dr. Weinstein and Hope Beauty um, would love to share all the information possible to help you guys look beautiful every day. So thank you. Thank you to your team. And have a great afternoon, Dr. Weinstein. And thank you to our patient yes. of honor. Yes. Thank you so much, Sarah. You're awesome. You look beautiful. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>